Mary and her loving the Lord and Mimi, who, who loves the Lord too. And she gets to show, she gets, she's, she gets to show the Lord uh, to Miss Ruby uh, every day, and that's pretty amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, so a- as we enter into this um, first uh, week of Advent, and, and Miss Ruby and Miss Joanne, um, hey, listen, a big thank you to Miss Joanne for uh, encouraging and teaching Miss Ruby to be able to get up here and actually sing. I mean, that's pretty awesome when you think about it. So thank you all so much. Um, But on this first week of Advent, uh, I wanted to share with you, again, uh, I stress that um, Miss Grace made it very clear that uh, it was my uh, job. You know, if I don't, I have to call the whole Prenatic family out. And it's just part of what I do on a pretty much on a weekly basis um, because I can, and so I do it. Uh, but I'm going to read some things to you. Uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of talk about the Christmas tree and the hanging of the greens and significance behind it, and a lot of, uh, a lot of Christians... Uh, will uh, tell you that this is a pagan holiday in the way that we celebrate. Um, So I want to try and dispel some of that uh, for you. There are some correlations uh, to a Roman pagan holiday uh, that took place during solstice time. And uh, that's pretty much why we get the date that we get uh, for the birth of Jesus. Nobody really knows what that date is. Uh, but this um, Roman holiday fell around this time, and this was a way to counter uh, the uh, pagan holiday. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But hanging, uh, I'm going to read this. Hanging of the greens refers to a Christian tradition where churches and homes are decorated with evergreen plants like wreaths and bows uh, during the Advent season symbolizing everlasting life and preparing for the coming of Christ at Christmas as evergreens stay green year round, even during winter. So what's the the symbolism uh, about this this key point of, of hanging of the greens? Well, the evergreen plants represent eternal life, signifying the hope of Jesus' birth and the promise of resurrection. Uh, Another key point about uh, hanging of the greens. Now, what's the symbolism? And I'm not going to get into a whole long, drawn-out thing, but the symbolism, the evergreen uh, plants like pine, fir, and holly represent eternal life and the promise of the new life through Jesus Christ. And this practice usually takes place on the first Sunday of Advent. The ladies were up here yesterday for pretty much as close to the first day uh, of Advent, first Sunday of Advent, uh, making the beginning of, uh, marking the beginning of the uh, Christmas season. And, and, and there are many churches hold special hanging of the greens uh, service where uh, readings and hymns focus on the meaning of Advent and the symbolism of the decorations. And what I will tell you is that uh, uh, this, in uh, for those that are, uh, I wouldn't say against, but that don't believe this, uh, they would say this is all just opportunity for us to gloss over uh, this pagan Roman uh, holiday. Uh, but here's, here's a little bit about Christmas. Uh, of the major Christian festivals, Christmas is the most recent in origin. Uh, The name, a uh, uh, a contraction of the term Christ's Mass, uh, did not come into use until around the Middle Ages. In the uh, early centuries, Christians were much more likely to celebrate the day of a person's death than uh, the person's birthday. And very early in its history, the church 
had an annual observation of the death of Christ and also honored many of the early martyrs on the day of their death. And before the fourth century, churches in the east, Egypt, Asia Minor, and Antioch, observed Epiphany, the manifestation of God to the world, celebrating Christ's baptism, his birth, and the visit of the Magi. In the early part of the fourth century, Christians in Rome began to celebrate the birth of Christ. The practice spread widely and rapidly uh, so that most parts of the Christian world observed the new festival by the end of the century. And in the fourth century, the controversy over the nature of Christ, whether he was truly God or a created being, led uh, to an increased emphasis on the doctrine of the incarnation, the affirmation that the word became flesh in John 1.14, if we remember uh, that. Um, it is likely that the urgency to proclaim the incarnation was an important factor in the spread of the celebration of Christmas. I've got one last thing that I want to share with you, highlighted here. It kind of talks a little bit about this Roman pagan holiday and how they intertwine. Although there are various theories of the selection of December 25th, the most likely accepted is that this date had already been a major pagan festival, uh, that of Saul Invictus. And the meaning of that is the birth of the unconquerable sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N. Marking the winter solstice, uh, the sun's triumph over darkness. You see how the, there's a, a, a parallel in terms of looking at what that uh, seems to be. And with the triumph of Christianity, Christmas replaced the pagan festival. Christians, um, having applied son of righteousness uh, in Malachi uh, 4.2 uh, to Christ. And so that's really in a nutshell without going into you know, 30 pages of explanation about this, but that, that's really where we are when we talk about the hanging of the greens, when we talk about where does Christmas really come from. Realize it wasn't until late in the Middle Ages that it became a celebratory uh, portion. Um, I, I was listening to um, John MacArthur, and, you know, we, we celebrate uh, Santa Claus, right? It's a fun part of Santa Claus. But, you know, he, that's a bad, we're not to worship Santa Claus, and that's a whole nother uh, factor. He might be a little bit of fun or whatever, but let's be real. Santa Claus is not Jesus, and we don't worship Santa Claus. We worship Jesus Christ. And so when, when I think about this, uh, I thought it apropos uh, also with a little bit of uh, uh, encouragement uh, from grace uh, to talk about this. Uh, because we're in this mode of hope. And we go through life in, in a perpetual state of hope. We're always hoping. And uh, I hope blank. And you can fill in the blank. I hope, you know, uh, whatever it is. I hope. And you fill in the blank. My question for you this morning is, what are you hoping for today? Besides the short message from me, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I'll just kind of throw that out there uh, to you. Exactly. Um, but uh, too bad, so sad. I'm, I'm in the pulpit and I'm going. Um, so, uh, but uh, with that said, um, let me invite you guys to open your Bibles uh, to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're going to be in, in Luke. We're going to be in chapter 1. Uh, and uh, I believe chapter 1, we are in, cha in chapter 1, and we're going to read from verses 26 through 38. 30, uh, 26 through 38, the gospel according to Luke, chapter 1. Let's read God's word. If you feel um, healthy enough and invigorated by everything so far, stand as we read the word of God. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged 
uh, to a man whose name was Joseph, uh, Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at, the, at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive of your, in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will, be, he will reign over the, uh, uh, the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be uh, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You may be seated. That's God's word this morning. That's a whole lot of text. I don't know um, about you, but I, I went through that text multiple times. You know, while you guys were all uh, sweating and laboring here, uh, I was uh, rolling around in my study yesterday trying to figure out how to put all of this on paper and, and not be here for four or five hours. Um, so I cut it down to three. I hope you're ready. Um, Susan brought uh, a pumpkin pie, so we, we're, we've got sustenance um, to last, um, and that's all I, you know, I can share with you. Um, but what's going on? Let's kind of take a look, because this morning uh, we begin our Advent series. This is it, and the Advent series is going to be known as A Bright Future. This is where we're going to go over the next several weeks. To, uh, this morning, part one, Christmas hope. Christmas hope. I'm always hopeful around this time of the year. As crazy as it gets with trying to figure out how to, how to get money to, to buy the things that everybody wants and we get all frustrated about that and are we going to cook enough food or are we going to cook too much food and where's everybody going to sleep when they get to the house for those of you that have family coming into town, uh, all those things. But to me, um, this is a time of hope. This is a time of celebration uh, because there is a God who thought enough about each and every one of us that he came, he lived, he died, and he rose so that we might live forever. And that's pretty awesome. So turn your frowns upside down and let's go. Um, we're moving. So this is where we are. What's, what's going on? Well, if you go back in the text... Uh, before we get to verse uh, 26, uh, there was this priest, uh, Zacharias. Uh, some uh, uh, translations have him known as Zechariah, uh, but uh, in the NASB it's Zacharias. And he was married to a woman by the name of Elizabeth. Elizabeth was what? She was related to um, Mary. And so they were a righteous couple. And Zechariah has a vision in the temple. The angel comes to, to, the angel of the Lord comes to him and tells him that Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And he starts cracking up. He's like, you've got to be kidding me. There's no way. One, it's kind of, a, I guess I would equate it to Sarah and Abraham. I mean, she's barren. She's old. There's no way that's going to happen. And his lack of trust, being the righteous priest that he was, even his lack of trust, when he walked out of there, remember, he couldn't even speak the name of his son until he was told it was okay. 
So he was silent. Nobody knew what was going on. And so, I mean, it's one of the, one of the, the great events in biblical uh, history. Um, and so Lord comes to him, tells him Elizabeth is going to have a baby, and says his name will be John. And Elizabeth was old and barren. Zacharias had a hard time believing, as I mentioned. And the first part of our hope is announced. There is hope in John. Why would we have hope in John? Because John was going to be the forerunner who opens up the ability to uh, have Christ burst onto the scene. Remember, it's John who baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. John was, was preaching what? He was preaching repentance. And he says what in the Gospel of John? There goes one who is greater than me. And so we, we see all of that taking place. Uh, and then the angel moves north to Galilee, uh, to Nazareth. And there we see Joseph and his betrothed wife, Mary. They're engaged. Um, there's a whole historical background behind engagement within the Jewish religion during that time. Just to kind of bring you up to speed with that, uh, a marriage contract would be done. There, there was no consummation of the marriage. They were engaged. Uh, typically, uh, the son uh, was able to pick out the wife that he wanted. Uh, the uh, father of the daughter agrees to it. They have a binding contract. Then they go through a period of engagement. Um, there is no sexual contact during that time. All of those things are taking place. Mary is between the ages of 13 and 15. You, you get all kinds of variations. A lot of people think she was closer to 13 than she was to 15. Um, and you will see people talk. She was 14, so they put it right in the middle. Um, but that's, that's really the age range of where she is. But... As we enter this text this morning, this passage this morning, we are introduced to what the second hope is. And that is the hope of the virgin birth. And so, um, three uh, points that I have for you this morning. First one being the path to hope. And it covers the first couple of verses um, we start off uh, really now in the sixth month. The, the reason that he says the sixth month, it, it might have been the sixth month of the year, but really the reference at this point is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Because you remember as you move forward in the text, when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, what takes place? John leaps in her stomach. The Holy Spirit has overwhelmed him. Why? Because he knows here comes the mother of the one who is going to give birth to the Son of God. Woo, that's pretty, pretty awesome stuff. Um, get excited about it. So who are the players in this scene? Well, there are, as always throughout the Bible, we talked even a little bit about this this morning in men's Bible study. Yes, we had men's Bible study this morning, just throwing that out there. Um, but... Um, we, we talked about the fact that God is in the middle of every aspect of every word that is in what we call uh, the Bible. Uh, he is the central character. But in this text, in this context, what do we see? God reveals himself through who? The angel Gabriel. He is an angel of the Lord. So that's our first character within this scene. If I was playing uh, if this was a play or, or a movie. Um, and then the second one, obviously, uh, is Joseph. And why is he significant? He's a descendant of David. And if we go back again historically, looking at what God promised David, he said, what? Your kingdom will last forever. And so we'll talk about that in the text as well. In, in the Jewish tradition, um, and the way it's set up and how, how Jesus falls into play is that legally Jesus is uh, Joseph's son. And as a result of that, he is part of the line of the kingdom of David. And Mary is the third. She's the young girl betrothed to 
uh, uh, Joseph. She's a virgin. Her name means exalted one. In the Old Testament, it would be comparative to Miriam. Uh, some people look at it behind, they take a look behind the Greek and try and relate it to the Hebrew. Some of them call, it, call her Hannah. Um, so uh, th- there's a lot going on there. Um, and that's where we are in these first two verses uh, as we see the virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. In our second point, all right, I know, but we're going to spend some time in the second point. So I got through the first point, but we're in sec- our second point is the hope within you. So we looked at the path to hope. Well, what was that path? The path went through Joseph and Mary. And the conduit was the angel of the Lord, Gabriel. And now we have the hope within you. In verse 28, we find out that Mary is favored. And it really is saying that the Lord is with you. There was nothing special about Mary. She was just a girl. People want to elevate her up to this this thing, but she was just a girl. She, She was a worshiper. She loved God. Earlier or later in the text, you hear her say, I am a bond slave. What does that remind you of? Who used to say that in the New Testament? Would write, Paul would write, Peter wrote he, that they were bond servants, that they were so connected with God that there was nothing that could separate them, that they would never be set free because they had been free to be a slave of the God Most High. Pretty pretty emphatic in that sense. But Mary is the favored one of God. She was chosen, just as each and every one of us have been chosen. But what was she chosen for? We don't get enough, I think, as I, as I read. We, you, know, you have a lot of speculation, a lot of different things. You don't necessarily get enough. But she was chosen for a single purpose, and that was to give birth to the Savior of the world. At the ripe age of 13 to 15 years, Think about anybody you know who's between 13 and 15 years old, children, grandchildren. Do they have at this stage of their lives, do they have the mindset to even comprehend what it was that God was going to do? Uh, We were watching something yesterday, Susan and I, I think, and um, it talked about this idea, you know, the, the, the brain does not become fully developed until you are roughly 25 years of age. And that's why it's so important, and tell your children, as as I tell everybody, uh, drugs are a bad thing, and they will mess up the development of your brain. Whether you think smoking weed is good, um, it's not. No matter how you look at it, it's not. But th- this is the mindset. That, that kids at that age, they, they don't make good decisions, right? That's why we're there. And here we are watching God entrust the Savior of the world to a th- 13, 14-year-old little girl. He chose her. Most Jewish mothers of that day, in anticipation of the Messiah, remember, The Jews were waiting for the Messiah. That was their whole mission. They thought one of them was going to give birth to this king who was going to save them. They thought in terms of physical. They thought in terms of military. They thought differently than what God had planned in bringing us a carpenter, a shepherd. But most Most Jewish women or mothers prayed for what was about to happen to Mary. They all wanted to be there 
for that. They wanted to be the one. And then in verses 29 and, and 30, we see a 13 and a half, 14 year old little girl go, I don't get this. I don't understand. How could she understand? She, she has not developed in such a way to really be able to comprehend. Listen to what, what God's word says. It says, but she was perplexed. First of all, it wasn't even as much as, why would a man come and address her, number one? But two, let alone an angel of the Lord. They never come to a woman. They always went to a man. Okay? Um, you know, my, my, uh, my thought process is, you know, this is a man's world. Uh, I'm just kidding, ladies. But I'm not. Um, it is. I, I, I didn't make it, but it is. this is the way that it is. God has given us each uh, different roles on how things uh, transpire. And so Mary's confused by, by what the angel said. It's not normal for an angel uh, to greet a woman. And then he goes on and he says, um, but, but she was perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. Verse 30, the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Take, take a breath. I guess is the best way I could describe it. I, I wrote down uh, d deep breath is, is what the angel says. And, and, and don't worry, I am here on behalf of the Lord. You got nothing to worry about. And this is the hope that he is presenting. There is hope in God above. There is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is hope. No matter what your circumstance might be today, there is hope. And so um, he says, you're receiving. Um, first, he says, to, listen, you have found favor with God. And he says, you are receiving divine blessings. The men are studying um, spiritual formation right now. And within the area that we covered uh, today, we talked about meditation on the Word of God. Um, now, she wasn't meditating on the Word of God, but she was wholly connected to the Lord. And in the midst of that type of connection, um, we, we see uh, that we, meaning all of us, when we are studying God's Word, can receive the type of blessings, that divine blessing. It might not be uh, to, to, to carry the Savior of the world, but there are other aspects of our lives that God will use us in miraculous ways that we never thought possible. But you can't experience that um, in, if you're not in God's Word. I can't read the Bible for you. You have to be committed to learning who Jesus is, learning who God the Father is. That's something that you have to do. I can't read it for you. I, I can give you a, a inspiration on a Sunday and, and a quick word on a Wednesday um, and, and a Sunday school class, but, but it's God calling you to become intimate with him. And the best and only way you can do that is by reading his word. That's the way it is. And God found favor with her. And uh, he says, you are receiving divine blessings. There is hope. The hope of the world is being given to you. In verses 31 through 33, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Well, the name Jesus, Yahweh, saves. That's what Yeshua, Jesus, means. It, Yahweh saves. Well, take a step back. What is he saving us from? He's saving us from separation from God. And anybody who tells you that there are other ways to get there, they've missed it. 
And it's our responsibility to share that love with them so that they understand the truth. Just as Jesus had said in, in chapter 14, verse 6 of John, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we see that the hope is a son you will name Jesus, Yahweh saves. Only five other, check this out, um, only five other children were named before their birth, uh, in, specifically in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Solomon, and Josiah. And here in the New Testament, we see the name of John being told prior to his birth, so the Lord, you know that there was a special anointing upon him and Jesus. That's it. That's it. And so we see, we see that uh, if you go back um, to Isaiah uh, chapter 7, uh, verse uh, 14, um, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call him, his name, Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. He never meant for us to be separated from him. That's our hope in knowing that no matter where you've been, no matter where you are, or where you think you're going, God wants to be with you. That's our hope. And so we, we look through that um, <clears throat> and so on. In verse 32a, the first part, he will be more than just great. If you read this, it says... He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. You want confirmation, there it is. Very, very specific, right? <clears throat> he will be more than just great. It's not, he's not some guy who's going to be king. He is the king. And he is the son of the God Most High. They knew. Realize in context, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. Who is the audience, right? Who's receiving this? We have to think in terms of how they thought, how they received certain words. Not how we would interpret it for today. And we take what it is that, that the author is saying. We see what, is, what does it say about God? What does it say about man? What does it say about life? And that's how we should be working through the text. We talked about that this morning in, in, with the men as well. And so uh, in, in the latter part of uh, verse 32, he will, uh, he will be called uh, the son of the most high. What's the significance of this? The significance is that he is being represented as true deity. He hasn't even been born. And already he is being represented as deity. When people say, well, Jesus never said I, that he was God. Where does it say he was God? I mean, you can go through scripture and text uh, to, to show that. Um, all the I am statements and so on. In Colossians, Paul talks about it. And right here, Luke, in writing, uh, understand his biggest audience was who? Was Theophilus. 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 Okay? So he, here's this guy that he knows. He has to speak in terms that he will understand. And he is exposing the unborn child of this virgin mother to be the son of the Most High God. He establishes the deity of Christ right there. I mean, I've said that three times already, but it's important because I, I want it to sink in. If you go uh, to Psalms uh, chapter 2, uh, Chapter 2, verses 7. 
verses 7 through 9. He says, I will surely tell you of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. Okay? We, we see the foreshadow taking place as, as God is talking to David. Well, how does Jesus relate to David? He's from the direct line. It is that kingdom that God has given to Jesus. And so he says, uh, uh, ask of me and the very, uh, um, I'm sorry, ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You get it all. You shall break them with a rod of iron. Uh, um, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthware. The Christ will be set high on the throne. That's where we're at. That's what has been promised. That's our hope. And Jesus will reign forever, and his kingdom will have no end. If you look at verse 33, it says, and he will reign over the house of Jacob. Right? Here's the other uh, 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 validation. Uh, forever, and his kingdom will have no end. There is no end to what Jesus is going to do for each and every one of us. There is no end to who we are in God, in Christ Jesus. So here's my third point, the hope assured. So we talk about all this, but where's the assurance? Where's the assurance of this hope? In verses 34 through 38, let's take a look at this. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And it's impossible, she says, it's impossible for this to happen. But like us, she needed an explanation, right? We, we come from, from the, the, the house of, uh, if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, if I can't smell it, it doesn't exist. And the angel says, she was a virgin and unmarried. No logic, obviously, uh, to what the angel was saying. And he comes back and says, remember who Mary is. She is a strong, strong believer. And he says to her, you put your hope in the Holy Spirit. Because he is going to guide you. Put your hope in God the Father. In verse 35, it says, The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. He is himself God coming on to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, consume you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. He is God. You want to know if Jesus is God? He's God. I don't have to debate it. I, I don't have to sit there and try and scientifically articulate um, what it is that I know to be true. Because scientifically, there is nothing that, that a scientist can do to disprove. So I'm not in a position to have to prove anything. The Word of God is living. The Word of God is, is, is morphing every single day to draw us closer to Him. And so we see uh, all of that. Put your hope in the Holy Spirit. How? Well, he says he would overshadow her. In Exodus chapter 40, verse 38, quickly. I know it's hard for me quickly to do anything, but in verse 38, it's, it, it's the very last verse of, of the uh, book of Exodus. 
For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. God was with them. God is with you. As a believer, there is not a moment in time that God is not with you. How do you know that? Because at the moment of your conversion, the Holy Spirit indwelled you. The Holy Spirit will never leave you. The Holy Spirit will never uh, forsake you. The Holy Spirit is there with you. Tap into that power. Tap into it. That's our hope. That's our assurance. That's where we are. In verses 36, proof in the Holy Spirit through Elizabeth. It was a miracle with Elizabeth. That was something out of the ordinary. But this is even more. The, the, literally, the Shekinah glory that, that would overshadow her, the power, was more than just the fact that uh, uh, this old lady got pregnant. God himself overshadowed Mary and she gave birth to the son of God proof in the Holy Spirit through Elizabeth listen we, we see validation right we're, we're a world that lives a validate I gotta validate The thing that's so amazing about Mary is that she truly is exemplary in her submission to God. That's what makes her great. Not that there was anything great about her. What makes her great is her ability to submit. We, we as a people, have real serious issues with submission. We think of submission as a bad word. Submission is not a bad word. Submission is walking in countenance with the Word of God. That's submitting to the power of the one who gives you life. And I'm not talking about just life on this earth. I'm talking about life ever after. And so nothing is impossible for God. And I'll ask the question again, where do you put your hope? What do you hope in? Because that's something that you have to answer for you. And she says in verse 38, Mary says, Behold, the bond slave, doulos for the Greek word, right? The bond slave, the bond servant of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel says, departed from her. She goes, I tr excuse me. She goes, I trust you. And Gabriel, the angel of the Lord, leaves, and what takes place? It's done. Done. If you question what you have hope in, I'm telling you right now, hope in Jesus. It's who we have to hope in. H hope uh, 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 it, it can be tricky. We know that it can be tricky. And sometimes we have a, a false sense of hope. Have you heard that term before? Where we, we have this false sense of hope. I'm hoping that I'm going to play for the New York Mets in the World Series come 2027. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen as good a ball player as I am at 63. It ain't going to happen. Okay? So I know this. I know that. But we, we tend to have a, a, a false sense of hope sometimes. The world wants you to put your hope in it. We talked about that this morning. The, the world will constantly surround you with things to do what? To keep you away from the Word of God. Because Satan knows that if you are embedded in the Word of God, he has no hold on you. He can't get to you. He cannot confuse you. He cannot take you off the path of where you want to be. That is because you have your hope in Christ Jesus. 
And so we see that, you know, we, we, we put our hope in politicians, in movie stars, and even the guy on the street. They're famous for wanting you to, to, to come to them. The Bible tells us to put our hope in Jesus. He tells us he is hope. He's the only hope. There is no other hope. And if, if your, your hope is in the world today, And there are many, whether you're a believer or not, you tend to put your hope in the world. We just went through a political season of crazy. And what did people do? People are putting their hope in a fallen man or fallen men and fallen women as a, as a whole thing. Why are we putting our hope? God is the one who sits on the throne. We hope that God will use them for the glory of the kingdom, but we don't put our hope in them. And I think sometimes we misconstrue that, and it's a problem. And so if, if your hope is in the world today, you need to put your hope in the hope giver, and his name is Jesus. And I, I want to say to you, if you have never asked Jesus into your life, listen, I know. I, I say this, I, I literally say this every single week. It's not too late. As long as you have breath in your body and you're breathing, then you have the wherewithal to know that Jesus will save you. But I'm going to tell you, when you draw that last breath, if you have not asked Jesus to be your Lord and to be your Savior, and you have repented and believed that he, that he lived, he died, and he rose on the third day, that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. I, I'm, I hate to be a naysayer. But there's no hope after that. The hope is today. And if you have not asked Jesus to be that hope for you, I'm extending a, a very personal, intimate invitation to you right now. He is so waiting with open arms, no matter what you might think of yourself. Stop thinking, I'm no good. God doesn't see that in you. God sees one of his own. And he sees you in such a way that if you would just admit to the sin in your life, believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and confess that sin in repentance, his love will be so overwhelming to you you won't even know how to respond. You are going to be screaming from the rooftops, he saved me, a wretch like me. Let me pray with you. Father God, right now, I, I pray for each and every person in this sanctuary. Lord, I pray for those outside of this place, that, Father, that anybody who has heard your gospel this morning, that if they did not know you, that right now, today, they turned from a life separated from you and realized the hope, the hope of the world, Jesus the Christ. Father, I pray your mighty hand over each and every one of them, and I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, we're going to, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. And we're going to be uh, in a somewhat familiar area um, with um, Paul uh, speaking to the church in Corinth, which was uh, nothing less than um, a challenge, okay? Um, so, hey, George and Jacob, if you guys would just come real quick and, and hand these out.
um, to everybody uh, so that we can uh, partake. Um, I, I, want to, um, I want to also uh, encourage you, um, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, uh, I want to encourage you uh, to, before you partake, if you've, you're harboring any kind of crazy against somebody, uh, I want to encourage you to, to give it up to the Lord. He, he, he wants us to come to him with a, with a clean heart. And, um, and if you can, if, you, if something real bad going on in your life, uh, then just don't partake today. But as believers, God calls us to do this in remembrance of him. We only have two ordinances as Baptists. One is baptism by immersion, and the other being uh, the communion or the Lord's uh, Supper. Some call it the Eucharist, um, which is also um, possible. Uh, and looking at it, uh, some uh, denominations believe uh, that um, uh, so, some denominations believe that um, you're actually eating the body of Christ and you're drinking his blood. And that's contrary to what the scriptures uh, tell us. But what's going on in, in, uh, in chapter 11, uh, and normally I start it at verse 23. But tonight, t- tonight this morning, um, I started 28, and here's the reason why, and I want to read this with you. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, He is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And that's my point this morning, is that you, you need to be right with the Lord. And when I say be right with the Lord, not that you are sinless, but that if there is bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, It's not a time to come in remembrance of the glory of what God is doing in your life because you're doing something that is not what he has called you upon to do. Second thing that's very important in this process, partaking in the Lord's Supper is for those who have professed to be a believer in Jesus Christ, that they have uh, uh, confessed all the things that we have talking about have spoken about ba- baptism is a secondary thing it's a whole different kind of conversation remember baptism is an outward profession of something that has already taken place inside baptism does not save you the lord's supper does not save you these are acts of obedience But God asks you to come to him in such a way that there is, you're not judging anybody and therefore you are not being judged at this moment in time. And so why do we do this? Well, at the Last Supper, Christ said, there's some new things that are going to take place. I'm going. And they're like, where are you going? I don't understand. Where are you going? Listen, guys, you got to get right, he says. This, this is where we're at. And, and he looked at it and he said, this, this bread that I've broken, and he had looked at it, he said, this is a symbol of my body. And where I'm going, I'm going to break my body for you. Do you understand how now in verse 28 and 29, how important it is for you to come to the Lord in the right mindset and the right heart? Because of what it is that he did. He went to that cross. His body was broken for for us. And he prayed over this bread and he said, Father, I give thanks to you as I am ready to leave that you might impress upon those before me that there is a new covenant that has emerged. And it is a covenant of grace. It is a covenant of forgiveness. It is a covenant of mercy. This is the new covenant. As I have come to fulfill the law, so be it. I will do what it is that you call me to do. 
I am being obedient. And they ate. Well, there's more to it. Because if you're not in the right mindset, and you're not in the right heart, how could you drink in remembrance of the blood that he shed at Calvary? God did something unbelievable. As Baptists, I will say to you, in this church, we take open communion. And open communion means that if you are a professing believer, you are encouraged to partake with us. Other places believe if you're not a, a member of their church, if you haven't uh, devoted yourself to a particular denomination, all kinds of nonsense. Those guys at the Last Supper, they what denomination were they? They were followers of Christ. The thief on the cross, was he baptized? No. Jesus just said, hey, today you're with me. So the baptism didn't save him. His confession is what saved him. His repentance is what saved him. His belief in Jesus is what saved him. That is what got him into heaven. That is what gets you into heaven. Not partaking in the Lord's Supper, not being baptized, belief and confession of Jesus Christ, admitting that you're separated from him. That's what gets you into heaven. But as he spoke to his disciples, he said, this blood that I shed, and we talk about it a lot, the blood that Christ shed at Calvary did what? It washed us clean. That is what the new covenant is all about. And he, he, he poured the wine and he prayed, Father, right now, Lord, I pray over this wine. And I say uh, to those who believe that as I shed this blood, so too that they might partake in remembrance of me the blood that I have shed or will shed at Calvary. And I pray, as your pastor, I pray for each and every one of you that you would know that the blood that was shed at Calvary was done so that we might be washed clean, that we might be set free, so that we might have eternity with Christ Jesus. And we drink. We've entered a season of hope. We're going to enter throughout these next several weeks this, this joy, this peace, and this love. All of which God has for us. All of it of which was represented in Christ's birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. That's what you should take away with you, knowing the world cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. Father, right now, Lord, I just thank you for what it is that we've experienced this morning. I thank you for each person who's here. And I pray, Father, this morning that we would uh, give in a way uh, that would be representative of the thankfulness and the hope that we have in you. Father, you ask us to give with a cheerful heart. May our hearts be full to give in an overflowing way that we might honor you. Nothing we have belongs to us. Everything we have was given by you to us. How could we not but give back to the giver? And so I thank you for what it is that you're doing here at Sawdust Road. I thank you um, for the offering that we're going to receive uh, this morning. And we praise you. 
And we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I'll ask um, um, Matt and... Um, hey, Isaiah, come on. It's time for you to come up here and say hello to everybody. Let's go. Um, and if you guys would just uh, pa pass, out, uh, pass out the plate. Um, also, as this is taking place, thanks, Bob. Um, as this is taking place, um, there is a receptacle on the back wall if you're more comfortable doing that, as well as you can give online. What's our website? Sawdustroad.org. Absolutely. We should all know that website. Uh, I want to encourage you uh, to go look at our website. Um, we post our sermons there. You can go to our YouTube uh, channel at SRBC Sermons, and uh, you can watch uh, and uh, laugh at some of the things that I make mistakes about and uh, all of that good stuff. But um, with that said, I don't know about you, I'm really excited that it's the Christmas season as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And I want to thank uh, all the um, ladies and Matt uh, who was here. Uh, he was the muscle yesterday. And uh, I just want to thank everybody that was here yesterday um, our sanctuary looks beautiful, and it couldn't be without um, the efforts of each and every one of you. So thank you all so very much. Um, you're dismissed. Go have a great Sunday. Church Council.